If I were to ask you, what do you know about the Salvation Army? My guess is the vast majority of people say, oh yeah, they're the people who ring the bell at Christmas time in front of a stores with that bucket for donations. Or, or you may think of a thrift store. Well, listen, the Salvation Army is so much more than that. And today our guest is Captain Jeff Marquis who is with the Salvation Army here locally. Uh, welcome to the show. Thank you. It is, it is great to have you here because I think for the most part, there's a whole lot about the Salvation Army. It's history, who they are, that the vast majority of the people don't know. Can you tell us a little bit about who is the Salvation Army? Um, the Salvation Army started um, over 150 years ago uh, in the east end of London uh, by a Methodist minister. And it actually, it wasn't always called the Salvation Army. Um, it was called the Christian Mission for the first eight years of oh, its yeah. existence. And uh, basically, William Booth, uh, a Methodist minister, um, wanted to go and essentially be a traveling evangelist. You had intense poverty at this time uh, due to a part of the a side effect of the Industrial Revolution, where you have so many people relocating to the city in London. And so poverty was just so um, intense at, at this time. And so uh, people were returning to alcohol uh, as a way to make it through the day. Um, the church uh, at this time wasn't as welcoming maybe as they, uh, as they could have been and as the church is now. Um, and so he asked the Methodist uh, uh, leadership that, to not have a congregation and so that he can do this full time, really the, what used to be wow. called the open air meetings. Yeah. Uh, standing on the corner, just uh, preaching the gospel. And nice. uh, the Methodist church, he was a gifted speaker, and they said, thanks, but we want you to pastor this congregation. Um, and he said, well, thanks, I'm going to step out and go on my own. And so uh, his initial goal, the, the goal was to never to start a, a church. His, his goal was to uh, go into the pubs, go into the slums uh, of London, uh, introduce people, um, get them saved, and then kind of reintroduce them back into church. Uh, and just slowly over time, people wanted to remain with him. Uh, and so the church very much uh, came out of that. And so what people don't always understand is, uh, we A, that we're a church. Uh, and because of that, um, our mission statement is to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and to meet human needs in his name without discrimination. And, and so all of the things that we do, the social services, uh, the shelters, uh, the feeding programs, all of that is driven by our understanding of scripture and caring for the poor. So now the, uh, the Salvation Army is across the United States. Yes, it's across the world. I believe the current number is 131 countries. There's a saying wow. that the, the sun wow. never sets on the Salvation Army flag. Um, as, the, as the Salvation Army expands, um, it was 1888 before the Salvation Army, uh, 1780, I'm sorry. I'm not the best with names and this is live. <laughs> so okay. don't, don't yeah. hate me. Um, <laughs> but it was, it was a good amount of time before the, uh, Salvation Army even came to America. Yeah. All uh, right. Cause it started in England and it, it, it was actually initially started by a 16 year old girl, uh, in Philadelphia. Uh, her parents, uh, her name was Eliza Shirley and her parents relocated here. Uh, and she became an officer at, wow. uh, I believe at 15. And wow. asked, there was not as That's many awesome. regulations, I guess, at this right. time. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she asked William Booth that I want to go and I want to start the Salvation Army there. Wow. Uh, and William was reluctant at first. William and Catherine Booth, we always focus on William, but really William and Catherine Booth collectively, they were just, there was a reluctancy. Uh, there was an unknown about this new world even still, that uh, wow. an apprehension. And so they said, go. And if it works, we'll send reinforcements. And so she came and they... Uh, acquired a chair factory in Philadelphia, uh, and eventually things grew, and they sent word, and they sent eventually um, George Scott Railton and the seven Hallelujah Lassies that came over and landed in New York. And so, if you go, there's a, there's a park that actually commemorates the arrival uh, of the Salvation Army. Oh yeah, in uh, New York. In New York, wow. um, um, mentioning cool this, and so um, it, it was. There's always big, varied gestures, but it. The Salvation Army has just slowly expanded. Uh, that there, we have a song called "The World for Christ," and it's a that's not just an arbitrary statement. But there's the belief that um, every person on earth should have the the right uh, and the privilege of hearing about the gospel. So you have a, a church in the congregation yeah. as well downtown here. Yeah, 
Okay, that's awesome because I know the demographic you're talking about, there are some homeless here and we, we do have, um, the, our congregation mm-hmm. here is very mixed and welcoming. So that's awesome to have another church downtown. Yeah, so the Salvation Army is primarily a church and that's uh, so often over the years, you had this preach the gospel and meet human needs. Uh, and the way that that's been articulated over the past hundred years or so, uh, there's been some people that look at those collectively there's some people that look at those um, as separate entities, but that interact together. Uh, for me, you want, it's a, one's a natural outpouring of the other. Um, there was an early saying, uh, there's lots of sayings in the Salvation Army, uh, okay. that William said, soup, soap, and salvation. Uh, and the idea is that if somebody is hungry, if somebody doesn't know where they're going to sleep, if they've got uh, massive needs that they have, they're not going to be receptive to the gospel, yeah. right? If they, if they haven't eaten in two days, they don't want to hear that Jesus loves them. If Jesus loves me, he'll pro- help me with this. Right? Sure. Right. And, and so the idea that if I can, if I can clean you up, if we can get, help you with these basic human needs that, um, you know, as a part of the, the American spirit is a, a, a natural, which should be a natural right for everyone. If we can help to do that, then people become more receptive. And, and that's a part of the psychological makeup when someone is even becomes homeless, right? They, they, they get into a self-preservation mode and yeah. um, things that you never would have ex- been acceptable at one point now uh, because you haven't eaten in two or three days. It's like, okay, yeah, I'm going to steal something from the grocery store because I don't want to starve. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you've got to meet those needs. Sure. Now, I don't say first, but you have, to, mm-hmm. you have to treat the whole person. Yeah. So you're a captain yes. in the Salvation Army, which I think is also a reflection of how, lo- how long you've been in the, uh, mm-hmm. in the Salvation Army. And you are in Martin County. So why don't you tell us a little bit about who is the Salvation Army in Martin County? Yeah, so Martin County, our command actually covers Martin, St. Lucie, and Okeechobee counties. Okay. Uh, in Martin County, the, the, the Salvation Army is, the what it looks like in each community, um, is driven by both the needs of the community as well as just, in reality, what we can financially support, right? Well, what, what the community is able to help us uh, do. And so in Martin County... Uh, we have uh, what I would say the, the social service center. And so this is where people come for financial assistance, for the food pantry. And that looks in two ways. You have an emergency financial assistance where I've got an eviction notice. I've got three days to pay my rent or I'm going to be on the street. Or I've got a shutoff notice and I owe $400 uh, in electric. And so I, if I need to if I want to have lights on, if I want to do that, I have to cover this. And so they can come in and, and that can happen. They can get financial assistance once every two years. Um, I wish we could do more, but that's also just driven by the resources that we have. The other side of that is we have a program called Pathway of Hope. Uh, and this is right now initially designed for families, and it, but it's trying to help transition someone out of poverty. Um, what More often than not, the, the clients that we, the beneficiaries that we deal with, um, are what is called the fancy term is Alice, which is asset limited, income constrained, employed, uh, and a much easier way of just saying the working poor people who have jobs who have a roof over their head, uh, but and so they're above the poverty line, so they don't qualify for a lot of the benefits, but they're under the basic cost of living. Got it. Um, and so they are not able to make it from month to month, and so we work with them on budgeting. Uh, sometimes it's not about budgeting. If you work. 40 hours a week making minimum wage. There's no, there's no, no matter of the amount of budgeting, you're not going to be able to stay in Martin County. Right. And so we have to do something to alter that, to change that. And so we work on, on job skills training, trying to up that dollar amount that you can, that you're eligible for. Um, and so that's a pathway of hope program. Okay. Um, and then we also have a compassion house, which is a women's and children's shelter. Uh, it's a, it's an nice. eight, it's an eight room facility. Each room has the capacity for four to five people, depending on the size of the family. Uh, and this is, uh, homeless women and children who may be sleeping in their cars, maybe sleeping on someone's couch, uh, who don't have a permanent place to stay. Um, they can come and it's, it's an open-ended program in the sense where it's not the case where they come and you've got 90 days to get your life in order or move out. Um, they, they, they get intensive case management with the team there, uh, and they're given a every week. They're given tasks. Um, often, some of the women come in; they've never paid a cell phone bill. Like they, they were, for lack of a better term, were just completely taken care of. Uh, and the problem is, once that caretaker is no longer there, uh, they don't know how to do things. And so you have to kind of re uh, basic life skills where you and I are used to 
navigating, they need help with. Yeah. Uh, now it, you say you've got a, a limited capacity at, at what, at, is that typically full? Is oh, that, yes. It is. Yeah. So it's an eight. So essentially you can take the, the max is 32 uh, individuals, but really it's eight families. We don't mix families. Uh, you do have the capability to, if we have space to put single women, uh, multiple in one room, uh, each room typically has two bunk beds and its own shower. And then there's a shared living space. Um, right now the waiting, the wait list is 23 families wow. awaiting entry. Uh, mm-hmm. and that's families. And then there's another somewhere right in mid twenties, 25, 26 single women waiting entry. Um, and, and is there any plan to maybe expand that program? Based yes, on that we, waiting we list? actually, we have the initial plans. Uh, we, we own the property immediately behind our building and next to it. And so we have, uh, the plans to build duplexes. One of the challenges when a compassion house initially started, 10 years ago, the goal was to house complete families. Mm -hmm. Um, And that is a a significant need. Like, how do you navigate that? But then the the, the layout of the building and for safety purposes, um, it became a women's and children, which means any male 13 or older is not able to stay at this facility. And so now you're not even talking about boyfriends and husbands. You're talking about teenage sons Mm -hmm. to where if a, a family wants to come in often, if they have a high school age son, they have to stay with someone else while the mother and, and other children are there. Uh, so what these duplexes would they would build um, four duplexes, so it would be eight, so essentially doubling the capacity. Right. Mm-hmm. And what this would allow us to do is to revert back to what the initial goal was, and that is to be able to help complete families to where because um, sometimes you have people that come and mm-hmm. want to come, but when they hear that their husbands can't come with them, mm-hmm. that, that's part of their support. They're just like, we'd rather live in our car. Co- and live in our car in a Walmart parking lot right. mm-hmm. uh, than have the husband have to stay somewhere else. Mm-hmm. Now, you mentioned that it's not a time-constrained uh, mm-hmm. thing. So um, what's, what's the average turnaround time that someone would be with you? Or? The average turnaround, I would say, is, is close to two to three months. Right. Uh, and that's average because everyone's going to come in at different stages. Some people might come in and they have a job but they, they have a divorce and they were kicked out of their situation or maybe they were, they're fleeing a, uh, an unsafe situation, domestic violence, uh, and they just need some time. Uh, most often, but if, they, but if they've been homeless for any length of time, sometimes you need 20 to 30 days just to kind of get the cobwebs out, right? Yeah. To try to figure mm-hmm. out. And then once they kind of get that, uh, they're actually able to attend um, IRSC for free. Um, if, you are, wow. if you are, they have a, IRSC as a program to where they just have to verify that they're homeless. So if they're staying with us, they're mm-hmm. homeless. And so uh, we've had people who come in who maybe were close to finishing a nursing degree or need to get recertified. Uh, we had we have a woman that came through our program a few years ago and, and is now heading a nursing program uh, at a hospital in California. Nice. And she was able to regain her certification here mm-hmm. and relocated. So everyone comes through differently. One of the biggest challenges we have is finding landlords that are willing to accept these individuals. Because yeah. the problem is, if they're with us, they've been evicted at least once, if not two or three times. And so we are not going to have them exit the facility into an unsafe situation. And unfortunately, there are, mm. uh, I, I want to tread light, but predatorial landlords, right, where they're going to, it's not uh, going to be safe. It's not, and we want to put them in a place that's solvent, that's, that's successful. Uh, and so sometimes we've had, we've had families stay an extra two to three months just who've had the money to move out, who's ready to to do that, but they just can't find a place, whether it's for because the rents are too high or because landlords are, are apprehensive because of their rental history. Yeah. So you've got Pathway of Hope mm-hmm. as a ministry. You've got Compassion House yep. as a ministry. What else is the Salvation Army in this area? So we also have a, every Friday night, we have what's called Booth's Cafe, which is a soup kitchen. Uh, so you can come by, and uh, if you've if you've never come, and I'm, you told me I look at this you camera if can. I want to get directly, <laughs> you need to come on Friday between 5 and 6 to the Salvation Army at 821 Southeast Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. And that is because we have a a wonderful chef. And if you came in, we've got people who come from all different kinds. It's not just people hear soup kitchen and they're like, or or they're like, oh, I'm not homeless, so I'm not going to go. I can do this. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's just a fellowship component. We do have seniors that come that just they sit together. Well, right now they can't because of the restrictions. <laughs> but once we resume, you come in and you get a delicious meal. And there's a she usually makes anywhere between eight to twelve different salads of noodles. Wow. Um, and you just go through, and it, it is delicious, and it is so good. Uh, and you have the fellowship before that. 
Um, at 4.45, you can come uh, and hear a devotional and just have a little bit of a short worship time before we start at five o'clock. Uh, and so that happens on Friday nights. Um, and then we have, for lack of a better term, everything that a typical church would have, right? So we have Sunday morning meetings. Okay. Um, like a, because We were started by a Methodist minister. So doctrinally speaking, we align with those, you can actually Google Salvation Army Doctrine. There's 11 of them. I can recite them, but no one want, you'll have people leave. No one will want to stay. Um, but uh, you can go on, and we, have, uh, we used to have Sunday school. You know, it's, it's hard at this time to talk about what we do because so many things have taken a, a pause. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, on Tuesday nights we, we, is our family night. We used to have adult Bible study separate from our kids' programs. Um, and what we did was sometimes... We wanted families to be able to come together and, and do things together. Uh, and so on Tuesday nights, well, once we start back up again, we'll be 5.30. You can come and have another meal from Chef Wendy. Um, and then at 6 o'clock, uh, the kids go into uh, what's called Club 316. Uh, or And they do a, a, essentially an age-based youth discipleship program, essentially is what it is. Mm-hmm. And then uh, the adults come in with me, and we have a Bible study in the other room. And that lasts about an hour, hour and 15 minutes. And... Uh, it's a wonderful time of fellowship for our congregation, and we've got people come through that just come for that, right? They have they attend somewhere else, uh, and but they want to come and have the fellowship. Uh, uh, at ten thirty on Thursdays, we have a, a, a women's group called Home League, uh, which is a very old term that they just kind of stuck around. Again, we've been around for a long time. Yeah. Uh, but it's a it's a it's a women's group that uh, comes together and they focus on fellowship, on service. They raise money for a children's home in Mexico by making. Uh, pastries and selling them at our store on US One. Uh, and then Friday nights, uh, in conjunction with the Boost Cafe, we also have a teen night. Uh, so we have a, a youth pastor named Daniel Jones who does wonderful work with those kids. And uh, they come together and it's a, they do a program called Core Cadets, um, which uh, essentially is just a discipleship program for teens. We have wonderful. a lot going Sorry, on. Yeah. <laughs> we stay busy. Hey, so you mentioned a store on US One. Tell yes. us a little bit about that. So, uh, like most people know about the Salvation Army Thrift Store. Uh, a few years ago, they rebranded it as Family Store, which just created a little bit of confusion, but it's the same thing. So, if you see Family Store, it's, it's a thrift store, and it's where we take uh, donated items and sell them um, at a discounted rate. And so, that really has two sides. One of which is it's a service to the community because even Walmart can get expensive at times. Um, and so, you come in and it's a wide variety of what you need. Uh, and so you can come in and shop. We also use the thrift store as a way to provide vouchers for people that need things. And so often when someone's in Compassion House, they have nothing, right? right. Uh, and so when they're moving out, they have to stock a whole uh, apartment. Um, uh, mm-hmm. And so they, they can go there and they pick up what they need. Um, it's all, but it also raises money. Uh, it, is not, it is not cheap to run shelters uh, or to do these types of programs. And so all of the funds that are raised from the family store, it directly go back to uh, funding Compassion House and funding the other programs that we do. Uh, and so it's really kind of that threefold approach in the way it's able to function. Um, and so it's, it's, a, it's a very successful store, um, which we're blessed with here. Not, a lot of times uh, stores across the state of Florida aren't as, aren't as blessed as we are. And they might just break even or allocate just a small amount, but we're able to do well. The community is very generous. Uh, in both shopping there as well as um, donating, which is helpful. That's so awesome. So how can people get directly involved and help? Mm-hmm. So that can really happen in, in, in one of three ways, one of which is to volunteer. Uh, and you can volunteer in different ways. Uh, the, I'll, I'll keep saying the number if you want me to, uh, but you call and talk to Kim Johnson, who's our volunteer coordinator. Um, and, and there's opportunities. There's less now because we, normally we have 10 to 15 people on a Friday. It, our, our soup, our boost cafe is now to go, so that's less. But we also need people who who volunteer at our store, who help to go through. Uh, when you volunteer at, at some place like that, it keeps us from having to hire additional staff. Right. And so you're not only helping to do mm-hmm. things around there, but you're also uh, you're saving us money. It's, it's financially yeah. contributing mm-hmm. with, with through your, what's called gift in kind, through time in kind. Mm-hmm. Um, we have an advisory board. Uh, if, if you are a, a professional that has, we've got different skills. And so the Salvation Army doesn't have a board of trustees, but we have, uh, we do on a, a large level. We, that's, that'll be very boring if we get into the structure of the Salvation Army. But basically we have a local group uh, of business professionals who come and help to guide us. The Salvation Army, uh, we get transitioned, uh, unfortunately, frequently. And in order for us to stay consistent with the community, we rely on these advisory organizations. 
for people to come along inside. Uh, we have a 60-person women's auxiliary, um, which ultimately is a fundraising entity. Uh, they wow. they get together, they meet once a month, mm-hmm. uh, and they plan fundraisers, they plan um, items. And again, they just, uh, you might have seen uh, in the newspaper just recently, they just passed the $1 million mark that they've raised in their existence. Wow. wow. Uh, which awesome. is wonderful, and we're great yeah. to celebrate that. Uh, and so there's those two, two type of specific ways through the advisory board and the women's auxiliary, but also uh, just general volunteering. Um, mm-hmm. People that have skills that want to come alongside and say, how can we help you? Uh, if it's, it's harder when you come in and say, I want to do this specifically, and we will accommodate that as best as possible. Mm-hmm. But some people just want to be used. Every morning, for instance, uh, we get donated uh, bread and pastries from Publix or BJ's. Wonderful. And we have volunteers that come in and they take our minivan out. If you're out and about and see them driving around, they go through and pick that up for us and bring it back. And so that's all things that just help us be able to serve the community better. Mm-hmm. Nice. Do you have, I have a question. Go ahead. I was curious because we have a lot of different little um, um, places around town that help people. And I've lived in some communities where maybe all the churches and ministries got together within the county so that they could kind of collectively help people. And um, do, do you have any of that that you do, like working together with other ministries? So or? It, we do that quite frequently. Um, and, and, and the reality is that's required. There's often when it comes, if someone comes to us and they need uh, typically, we we cap the rent assistance sometimes at seven fifty to a thousand dollars. But someone might come in mm-hmm. and they owe eighteen hundred, mm-hmm. and so we'll call one of our partner agencies mm-hmm. um, and say, "Listen, we can we can pay a thousand. Can you pay the other eight hundred? Mm-hmm. And you work collectively with that. Mm-hmm. Also, we have different. We all have different skill sets, um, and it, it is irresponsible for me as a Salvation Army to say I'm going to do everything. You know, I'm that I'm going to. I'm going to shoulder this load by myself uh, out of some sort of of arrogance. Uh, But we have to lean on each other. And so we have to, we all have different things. Uh, On Wednesdays, uh, when we would go out and do a mobile feeding, uh, St. Mary's would make the food. We would pick up the food and take it out and go around. And um, we would work with that. Right now, we have a close relationship with House of Hope um, as they... They've made great connections as it relates to food and produce and those things. And so mm-hmm. they, we are, we're able to tap into that resource. And so um, the more we can work together, the better we're going to serve uh, the community. You've had some groups coming together, uh, to, especially, especially in disaster times. That's the yeah. thing that the Salvation Army does a lot. Unfortunately, we, just, we, we escaped this past weekend uh, with just a little bit of wind and rain, but um, we have a, a local, what's called VOAD, which is a voluntary organization's assisting disaster, um, as we work together because we all have a different responsibility and different skill set. Jeff, to bring it to a close today, I'd, I'd ask you to take a few minutes and just consider what would you like to tell our viewing audience about the Salvation Army, maybe in this territory or as a whole, what would be the message that you would want to leave them with? What would be the words that, uh, uh, when they think of Salvation Army, uh, I'm just going to say it's so much more than kettle pots and mm-hmm. thrift stores. Yeah. Uh, so maybe you could leave us with a parting word about the Salvation Army. Yeah, and, and, I, and I can do it through a little bit of a story. Um, early on in the early days of the Salvation Army, as it got spread further and further across, um, William Booth wanted to send out a word of encouragement uh, to his officers around around the globe, really, at this point. Uh, and at that point, that was through Telegram. And Telegrams, you paid by the letter uh, in terms of how long the message was. And so he uh, sent out a, a one-word Telegram to all of his officers. Uh, and that's, that word was others. Uh, and that's really uh, the motivation behind what we do, that, um, that every person, regardless of their background, regardless of their upbringing, regardless of their current situation, um, can live a life full uh, within the power of Christ. And so often we can get discouraged because we don't do this or that very well. And we don't fully embrace the, the wholeness that Christ offers. Uh, and so when we, when we do these things, and, I, and this is what I, I, if I wish that people knew, because more often than not, and I'm sure there's people even listening now, they're saying, oh, I had no idea. I mean, I, the most common thing I hear is, oh, I had no idea that you were a church. Uh, which has, unfortunately, its positives and negatives. Uh, but understanding that we, everything that we do, uh, the soup kitchen, the shelters, uh, the food pantry that happens five days a week, uh, 
um, it is all because uh, Christ tells us to, right? Yeah. That Christ tells us to to love uh, the unlovable, the to reach out to those who need it. Um, and so I'm very privileged, and and I'm grateful. And the Salvation Army is successful now because over the years there's been places like Revive and other churches and other just individuals that believe the same thing, that believe that Christ's love is for all, um, that Christ uh, died for everyone and not for just certain people. And so as such, we, we, we rely on partners, we rely on people to come alongside um, because we're all a part of the, the big C church. We're all part of mm-hmm. the body of Christ and uh, we have to we have to work together. That it's mm-hmm. the the lack of unity that you can see demonstrated now in our culture all, all across the board. Mm-hmm. Um, that if 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 we as the church can come together, both within our congregation as well as can you imagine if all of the churches of Martin County came together yes. and worked towards yes. a, a collective goal mm-hmm. that was not driven by how many people are physically in my congregation, mm-hmm. but was driven by the the changes that took place mm-hmm. um, in our in the community. I mean, a- amazing things can happen and it wouldn't be because of us. It would be because of Christ. Uh, and, and I hope to be able to be a part of that uh, moving forward. That's awesome. Jeff, I want to thank you for being here with us today. I it's really do. Pleasure. It's been very informative. Mm-hmm. Uh, Captain Jeff Marquis with the Salvation Army. Um, please consider uh, the season we're going into and what you know about the Salvation Army. You've learned a lot today. But you've always known they've had a thrift store. You've always known that they've collected uh, donations at Christmas time. But we all know what kind of year we're currently having in 2020. It's going to directly affect them. So why don't you reach out with the information that we're going to provide here in a minute on your screen with the phone number and information that uh, Captain Jeff has already provided. Reach out to the Salvation Army. Let's support this ministry so it can help those in need in our community. Thank you so much for joining us today on Revive Talk. God bless you and have a great day.